Hiya, this is Kitten Features, and you're listening to Show X Live with Ken in the student accommodation all the way in Scotland. Wait, that was years ago. You're listening to Show X Live with your favorite Scotsman Ken, currently residing in the U.S. of A., and Wayne, mostly from Colorado, but spending way too much time in the Howling Abyss instead of Summoner's Rift. Enjoy the show! Hello, everybody, and welcome to Show X. You're uh, watching us live today at 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. GMT on this Sunday, the 9th of August, 2020. Welcome to the show. As always, we're joined by Ken. How are you doing today, sir? I'm Van Babidozzi. Thank you for having me on, sir. <laughs> Outstanding. As well as our good friend, Todd. How are you doing, sir? It's not alive. <laughs> today. I say, yeah, I don't know oh, if either of us have that level of enthusiasm. There's, there's no way I could overcome Ken's intro. <laughs> like, there's just no way. I was say, that, that's a level of here that I, I just I, am I'm not, so, I guess. Like, I'm, so, I'm so excited. I almost feel bad for, like, being so happy today. Because uh, uh, I've just, like, set the bar too high, it seems. You no, have. no, you own it. That's you okay. take well, this it's, energy. We're going to talk about video game stuff. Though I'll end up, I'll end up being in a better mood as we talk <laughs> about video game stuff. Keep the MR. Nice. Hey, everybody. So uh, we want to let you know that today, as you see in the, see in the headlines of what we've posted out, we're going to be talking a little bit about what's coming up this year as we get into the holiday season with what has been announced uh, for the release of upcoming. I guess, I don't know if the term's always next gen at the time that we talk about it, but the new consoles that are going to be released by the premier uh, console companies of both Sony and Microsoft. So the Sony's PS5 that'll be coming out this fall along with Microsoft's Xbox Series X. And so we're going to be talking about those and seeing what we know today and what's coming up in the enthusiasm or what you might have out there, everyone, for which consoles you're looking at and what might be coming through. Uh, and what's like basically what's on your list for purchasing this season? In addition to that, though, we're going to uh, start off things by talking a little bit of cleanup. But before we get started, I want to say, how are you guys each doing? What have you been up to, Todd? What's been going on with you this last week? Much, much more Europa. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> and that's going to be the answer for the rest of time, I fear. Uh, I started a I started a campaign as Aragon, uh, and for those that don't know historically, what is today Spain was originally split up into two kingdoms. There was the Kingdom of Castile and the Kingdom of Aragon, um, and then in the north, right next to the Pyrenees Mountains, where uh, Spain borders France, there was a small kingdom called Navarre or Navarra. And uh, and uh, so I was playing as the Aragonese uh, and uh, working out a strategy to play as Aragon, form Spain, uh, and then reform the Roman Empire. But to do so in such a way that uh, the Castilians and the Portuguese were going to do all of the New World uh, and Old World colonization for me so that I didn't have to do it. Okay. So, am I am I the only one who had the uh, complete ineptitude to think that Todd was talking about Lord of the Rings Aragorn that you're he was playing as? No, I am <laughs> Aragorn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not a history buff, <laughs> evidently. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so again, for those that don't know, there were really five sort of traditional colonizing powers. Uh, back in the day, Portugal, Spain, France, um, England, and the Dutch. And so uh, if you play a game of Euro Europa Universalis and you just sort of let things run, the those countries will do what they historically did, is they'll all um, start to explore the new world and expand into the new world and form colonies in the new world and do all of that. But um, if you start as one of the two Spanish um, Iberian kingdoms um, and your monarch is the opposite gender of the monarch on the other, so one has to be a male, one has to be a female, doesn't matter which way, 
um, they'll marry each other. Okay. And so, and, and this happened historically that the, I think it was Queen Isabella married uh, a king. And I want to say Queen Isabella was uh, Castilian and the king was Aragonese, but I'm not sure um, if that's the way it worked out. But whatever, Any in any event, they marry each other. You get control of both Castile and Aragon, and, it, and that always works out to the player's benefit. So if you play as Castile, Castile takes over Aragon. If you play as Aragon, Aragon takes over Castile. Um, I, I didn't realize that this was so, uh, like, by default, there was so much actual history, that, if you know what I mean. I thought it was more like, uh, it set the stage of the time and what the powers that were at like, be, mm. but then the AI would just be let to run amok. I didn't realize it would follow historical pathways otherwise. It, it tr so in, it tries to. Like, you as the player can mess that up. Um, if you want to. So, for example, if you play as the Ming Dynasty in China, right, you can take the fight to the Mongolian to the Mongolian step hordes and prevent the collapse of the Ming Dynasty. Oh, nice. Wow, okay. Or, or you can play as one of the uh, as one of the Mongolian or Manchurian uh, step hordes and induce the fall of the Ming Dynasty. Like it's kind of up to, it's kind of up to you. Oh, you want to how you want to play? If you take the Manchurian route, you can end up forming the uh, you can end up forming the Qing Dynasty uh, somewhat later in the game. Um, if you do it as a Mongolian horde, you end up fa uh, you end up forming essentially reforming the Mongol Empire at some point. Um, and that. <laughs> That playthrough is kind of funny. There were in my playthrough of that, which was before the Emperor patch, there were Mongols from Japan to the Baltic Sea. And I owned all of it. Nice. <laughs> so it was pretty good. It was a lot of fun. Cool. That's, I always enjoy hearing your updates with that because you speak with such passion on uh, something that's so alien to me, like history and stuff. It's just, it's just been, I love that. I love people talking with passion about things that I don't necessarily mm. have. It's just it's kind of invigorating and enlightening. No, the the game's a lot of fun. I, I when the new Emperor patch came out because they messed around uh, and and enhanced a bunch of stuff in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a lot of time playing in Italy, and that's fun and all, but the early game can be a little tedious. Um, for various mechanical reasons. Uh, so I wanted to get out of that a little bit, and I didn't want to play the France game, and I didn't want to play the Burgundy game just yet, because those are going to be fun in their own right, but uh, I really wanted to get my feet wet with the Iberians again and see what the strategies were and um, you know how, how reforming the Roman Empire is going to be. So that's really the goal when you're playing in Europe. Um, is to restore Rome and just to see what that was going to look like uh, and what the strategies are to try and get there as early as possible. So I'm making way, but I'm not quite there yet. I need to figure a couple more things out. I think, I think what I need to do is I think I need to do the Castilian start, which means I have to do the colonizing, which is not great, but uh, uh, it's still doable. Cool. cool. That's sweet. Um, in the chat, um, ten and fifteen said, "So you get Philip of Aragorn and Isabel of Castile together, like Dark Helmet, and make them touch their kissy bits in your room." Yes, and then you get some large chunk of uh, the Iberian Peninsula, the islands in the Mediterranean, and uh, Naples, southern Italy. So it's uh, it's all good it's when they're naughty bits touch. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. Funny. Oh, very cool. Ken, how about yourself? What have you been playing and doing this last week or so? Kind of keep yourself entertained. Well, uh, my 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 sister in law was uh, temp visiting over the weekend. Um, nice. Again, I mentioned before that her and my uh, wife uh, went off for a trip to uh, 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 an empty house that they have <laughs> elsewhere uh, in the family. So they, they like they've both been quarant we've all been quarantined separately. Well, me and my wife together, obviously, but. My sister-in-law had been in quarantine uh, back home herself for months, and we've been quarantined for months ourselves. So them getting together is a pretty minor risk, considering it was a road trip, no flights were involved, 
and any gas stations or whatever, they just paid by at the at the, at the um, sorry at the um, dispenser, right? So it's a minimal risk kind of trip. Um, and there's a good way to still get out and not just be stuck inside all the time in the summer, which is which is uh, I applaud. I think we need to look for creative ways or, or, and safe ways to enjoy ourselves during the summer. Um, so she was here over the weekend, and uh, we had a lot of fun. We, uh, I, I, I cooked meat. How weird's that? I cooked Wait meat. a second, Ken. I thought you guys were all anti-meat. What's going on? Oh yeah, we are, but we also respect that other people are not, right? I mean, like uh, when we have guests, I'll, I'll go out and I'll buy chicken, beef, whatever, and I'll cook it up. It's kind of hard because I can't taste it along the way, so I'm sort of guesstimating. But it turned out I made an amazing garlic chicken, so that was good. Nice. Um, then on on the Saturday we came, we had this I we I got this uh, huge side of salmon, and I covered it in olive oil, and I cut up like a ridiculous number of garlic cloves. I don't want to think how many like like two dozen or something, and I chopped them up, and I uh, covered the, the the salmon in the garlic cloves as well, and then I used this um, lemon pepper seasoning and just like soaked the whole salmon both sides in this, covered it in tin foil. We went outside to the uh, to the outside barbecue and we we, we we barbecued it for like twenty minutes inside the tin file. I then unfolded the tin file a little bit, put it on full blast, left it for a few more minutes so it was seared, and we served it. And oh, beautiful, beautiful! Uh, and I love the fact that you can do that here. You know, getting a whole side of salmon is actually surprisingly cheap, even though I don't know how where they're getting the salmon from, mind you, because middle of Michigan. Um, but yeah, it was uh, that was awesome. So we had a really good time with the, with our visit, and, and then they're they're back off to the this other house again for a week, and then they'll be back again this weekend. So we had a good time. Very um, nice. Uh, I also passed my theory test in the past week finally. Um, so I, I I have I can now kind of theoret I can theoretically drive in the U.S. I can theoretically uh, drive. You you understand enough uh, of the hey, ways congratulations. we work. Theoretically, you theoretical should congratulations, be able to yes. get a license to actually drive. Yeah, I got a quote, so now I know how much it'll cost to get a single, you know, a single um, uh, lesson, and it's freaking expensive here. I don't know why. I'm, I'm tempted just to say to an Uber driver, like, I'll give you 10 bucks if you let me just drive your car for the next 20 minutes and get used to driving again, and then at that point, it'll be fine, right? Um, I mean, uh, apparently the, the tests in the UK are harder than here anyway, so I, I'm hoping I can just hop in and it'll be okay. I don't know. I mean, I, I know the theoretical differences now, so it shouldn't be that much of a difference. Whatever. We'll see. How, how long has it been since you've actually been behind the wheel? Well, I, I drove here a few times. Um, I got rentals and stuff. Yeah. Um, so, like, three months? Ah, you should be fine. I mean, it's fine. There's no difference. Yeah. yeah I, I imagine getting in the car, the first two minutes will be like, uh, just getting used to the car itself, not necessarily driving, right? And so long as I'm used to the car, I'll be fine. Uh, so yeah, that's that pretty much been my week. I didn't really have much else going on. Um, sadly, next week, my uh, I was supposed to be in Prague next week. Um, my, uh, my, my, my buddy Graham is getting married next year. And because I'm here in the US, he very kindly decided to have the stag a year early so that I didn't have to travel over there for too long, right? I didn't have to be in Europe for like a month and a half, two months to go to both the stag and the wedding. Um, then COVID hit, so we had already booked Prague. We've got the flights, got the tickets, everything for all the, the entertainment we had planned. And uh, yeah, now uh, now I can't go. So uh, that's uh, that was rather irritating. So they're all off to they're going to Prague. That's going to be fun. Oh. Scotland's got really, really good mates, so they're going to go have a good time. And I'm glad I'm glad they are. Um, and I'm also somewhat jealous because I want to be in Prague. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that, that's really been all I've been up to this week. Nothing, nothing particularly of interest. Oh, I also I also wrote my quiz because I'm doing the quiz for uh, for for my like a, a friend group. Um, yeah. So I came up with fifty questions, um, and I, I wish I could do them on the show here. And like uh, sometime that would be kind of fun to do like a quiz here. Um, but obviously they might be listening, and I can't give them any hints. So gotcha. Well, do you have, uh, a, that's, that's what do you have at least to, a Mr. Wayne? theme for what your quiz is about? No, actually, um, this time I've intentionally, I, I, I can't, I don't know if I want to give it away. I suppose, I suppose I can. Um, normally the quizzes are, are, they're 50 questions long and we have them in 10 question segments for different themes. Um, I decided to completely switch it around and instead of being that, I have the entire quiz being um kind of like qi you know the, the tv show the, the bbc tv show in the uk uh qi quite interesting um so, they they have this section called Stephen, general Stephen fry was the host for a long time he was yeah now it's um 
uh, what's her name? Uh, she has a name. I always, I always forget. Yeah. Even though I've watched QI a lot. But anyway, um, she, uh, yeah, they, yeah. They, it's, we have the segment called um, uh, General Ignorance, where it's about <laughs> facts that people think are true, okay, or not, right? And uh, or or they don't know the whole story or whatever. So I've kind of themed the whole quiz around this concept of stuff that will appear at first to be easy um or 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 it won't be so it's kind of like general knowledge since i figured that might be a little bit dull as well i've also i followed the sort of qi sentiment of um you get a full point for the for getting the answer correct but you also get a half point if you make an amusing answer and you and you can do both if you want to right so you can say like my funny answer is this but my actual answer is this and you have the potential to get like a point and a half and that is a bit more fun as well so uh I'm I'll, I'm happy to release the questions to anybody who's interested after the quiz has been completed, um, and they're they're mostly safe for work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. All right. So let's see. What have I been doing? Uh, for the main thing, when it comes to, like gaming and such, I I've been bouncing a little bit this week. Uh, still playing League of Legends like I normally do. Try to get an A RAM a day in to get my win of the day for little bonuses, as well as doing my. Uh, lately, it's been TFT, their uh, you know auto chess game. In that I've been yeah. trying to catch the uh, dailies, if you will. They they're more like weekly achievements for it, and so I've been trying to play through enough games to get those up because they're doing a uh, what is it? Some kind of blossom event right now, which like any one of the things that League of Legends provides is basically new skins, emotes, and things like that. And I usually I've unlocked through, them already. Yeah, yeah, through almost any one of those, I play just enough to get like two hundred credits of whatever that sequence's right. uh, thing is to buy one skin to get like one free skin from the game because I'm not going to pay any more money into it and I'm not going to like grind it so hard to try to get all the skins. So of whatever is usually like five skins or so for characters they have in each event they do, I found like which character do I like the most or do I not have any skin for? All right, I'll, I'll get enough credits to play that one. So that's what I've been doing so far with that. Um, beyond that, some things I'll talk about later about uh, checking out uh, some other means of gaming. But I also have continued to play a lot of Warzone. Uh, so Call of Duty Warzone, I've been enjoying that one continuously. Uh, a lot of everything from a couple solos, which I'm surprised I've done, but they just released a new, I think season five has hit for it. And there are little things, a slight map adjustments. They blew the roof off of the stadium that they have in the map where now you can actually drop and go inside the stadium instead of just run around it. And they added cool. a, one of the things I actually thought was kind of cool is they added a train that they've had tracks in the game, but now they have an active train moving around the tracks throughout the match that you can jump on as it's moving by and usually has at least one um, like weapons crate on it that you can open up. But what's really cool about it is you can get on there, hunker behind a few things, and depending on where the Battle Royale circle is closing in, it may actually give you an easy vehicle to just ride yourself into a safe zone or such that you have a good like gun nest from. Um, and I played on that one and I actually like the first solo match I did, I jumped in and found the train coming at me because it blares its horn, looked over, was like, oh, snap, train. I right. ran over to it with, I think, the silliest of um, uh, little just like I had not even a great gun at the time, but ran over, jumped on kind of the middle of the train. And I saw where obviously fighting had occurred and somebody had died and like picked up one of their guns. Sweet. And thought, okay, if somebody's killed someone here, there's got to be someone still hanging out on the train. And so sure enough, as I ran up and I got to the back of the train, there was someone kneeling on the very back end of the train who wasn't looking up. And I just looked down at him like, hey, what? took him out, grabbed a whole bunch of much better gear, including a uh, bouncing Betty that I then stuck on the train at the back of it in case someone else jumped on and uh, ran back towards the front until it led, led, uh, me, led me back into the circle in a better place. But just in general, I appreciate they continue to tweak and work with it. And having played through multiple Battle Royales, um, other than, I think, Apex Legends, I, th I think that the Call of Duty Warzone gameplay, which is free, you don't have to actually buy Call of Duty to get the Warzone game, um, is probably my favorite interaction or version of a Battle Royale currently out that I've played. And so I'm still enjoying that one. Uh, yeah, beyond that, hanging out with hanging out with friends a little bit over the weekend. I had an opportunity to actually do some in-person and I'll give a little bit of credit to the console for it. Uh, some overcooked on switch with lemon laser and some friends, uh, which is a fun thing to deal with. Although I will say on the switch with the 
well known by Nintendo and many Switch players issue of console controller drift. It makes that game so much more difficult when you like try to just stand still and suddenly your character decides to run off the map. Um, Nintendo, you need to fix that nonsense. It's it's known and it's one of those things that I've actually seen fixed by taking their nice wireless controllers, plugging them in via a uh, wired connection and the drift disappearing. And so it's oh, not, that's it, yeah, it's not actually like a hardware issue with the controllers. It's it's a legit issue somewhere in the console of how it deals with the wireless connection that it's just it's huh. it's infuriating. And so watching like watching Lemon play Overwatch or things like that when she's doing her competitive play, she has to, you know, when she's just waiting for the start, you'll see her her reticle just like drift up and to the right just by itself. And then so once she starts playing, she keeps constant motion out somewhat and it tends to keep it playable. But man, that's infuriating. So just stupid little things like that. But for the most part, that's pretty much what I've been doing game-wise. Other than that, still working on outside of it, trying to game my life and figure out how to get a honest budget together and keep track of things about uh, my finances because I have I've realized that I survive by generally making enough money and generally not spending so much money that I can continue to exist. And in the background, investing so much money from my 401k and stuff like that, that in general, at some point in my future, I should be comfortable when I go to like stop working. But I realize that's not really a plan. <laughs> And it's yeah, more of shoulds and will be maybe is not or not uh that's not a plan, no. Like I said, it's it's more a generalization that I'm on an okay path. And so I've seen some value uh for the idea that I should be a little more aware in specifics, yeah, such that I can yeah, better plan possibly. things coming up. Um and get yeah, ahead. I'm of... uh I, I really have no idea where I am. Right, you're in uh, Norway, and, and mostly, well, I'm in Norway, yes, but uh, relative to retirement, and part of the problem with that is there are so many sources of retirement income. Yes. So I've got the 401k, the business unit of Raytheon that I got hired into was pulled over from Hughes Aircraft, so we all got pensions. Yeah, I have and a those tiny are, one. <laughs> those are still good. Right. Um, I get a pension in Norway that's guaranteed through the government. And I'm saving independently and Social Security. Right. Because I paid into that from the time I was 16 until the time I was 38. Or 30. Yeah, 38. Uh, So there's going to be money from that, too. And like, I have no idea what that looks like at all. Like to even uh, to even try and estimate that at this point is just like yeah, I don't know. I have a better chance throwing dice. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, it's it's so, it's, it's, it's crazy I mean, to me in that same sense that there are so many things you have to take in to kind of figure out what that means. Yeah. <sighs> So I do not envy what you like what you're talking about of having to, you know, try to figure out, decide or whatever what it what it's gonna take to be retired I, or whatever that might mean. Yeah. And I read this really dope um series of articles on retirement investing on medium. And like there's a formula for what you wanna do, right? So Essentially, what you want to do is you want to figure out how much money you spend on everything. So total yep. up your mortgage, car payments and groceries and credit cards and all of the bills. And you put that into uh, you put that into a lump sum and you multiply that number by 25. I have absolutely been hearing that exact same calculation. Right. And so once once you the sum total of your investment a retirement investment it's that number you're done yep and and the theory is because your investments are investments and not in simple savings accounts 
that the common the the return is the return is estimation over the long term seven percent real. And so you can take four percent of the total balance of everything you've invested out. Three percent theoretically gets eaten up by inflation, but let's be real, inflation hasn't been three percent in twenty years. <laughs> right. So between those two, that's the seven percent that the that the account would make. And so in theory, when you get to when you get to that 25x what you spend in a year number, you should be able to take four percent of the balance out and, and the, live the, off it. And the accounts replenish themselves. Yep. Yep. Figuring yeah. inflation in. Yep. No, that it's right? I appreciate hearing that from you as well, Todd, because that's something that a lot of this has come up from my um my dating lemon because she is basically living that life and is very much already figured out for her what her happiness index is, like what things bring her joy. <laughs> and yeah. is and you would appreciate this heavily, Todd, that she is a min maxer when it comes to life and efficiencies of spending. Um nice. I, I commented as being a bit of a minimalist from my perspective, but I can't fault that she is finding joy in what she's doing. It's just in doing so, what she sees in my life is it is untenable <laughs> for like to have those expenses and figure out that number or the amount of money I need to match that and keep this lifestyle is so big in comparison. Sure. Um, so you know, but those same numbers, those same logic of trying to figure out how to game your life in such a way that you can actually plan for retirement or some point at which you're not having to work for the sake of survival and much more so maybe being able to work in ways you enjoy and invest your time where you like to, because yeah. the money aspect is not your driving factor. I, and it's a yep. great philosophy. And there's a whole discussion there that if people want, we you know can get into. And there's a lot of discussion about what it means to kind of hit that point in life that you are retiring, right? Whatever you call that. So, but no, I appreciate hearing those same numbers from Utah because that's what I've been hearing and seeing numbers about and what that might mean. My problem being right now is I don't know what my expenses are. And so yes, I can't well, do the times 25 math. Right. So there's a couple of things to think about. That whole 25X calculation thing is a perfect world scenario. Oh, right? yeah. It yeah. doesn't take it doesn't take into account that we're in the middle of a massive asset and credit bubble. And that bubbles by their very nature have to burst at some point. And so what's going to happen if you have, you know, what's going to happen if you followed this advice for 10 years and you're at 20 times, you know, 20 times your annual expenditures, you only have five, five X to go. Right. And, and you're done. And you estimate you can get it done in the next 36 to 48 months. Yep. And then the bottom drops out on the stock market because everybody's decided that reinflating asset bubbles isn't the thing to do anymore. <laughs> right. Or they uh, or even better, they decide to change the way inflation is calculated to take into account all the places where the inflation is. And so the inflation rate spikes to like 25 percent. And the only way to control it is to spike interest rates or reduce the reduce yeah. the flow of money into the economy, which for those that don't know, uh, is what Paul Volk Paul Volcker did in 1979. Important date, you should all know it. Um, because I do you remember? I'll I'll tie this back to something nerdy. Do you remember <laughs> in Ghostbusters where they decide they're going to buy the firehouse? Yes. And they and they come out of the bank, and Venkman says to Ray, "Don't worry about it, Ray. Everybody's got five mortgages these days." And Ray says, "At nineteen and a half percent interest, you didn't even bargain with the guy, right? That gotcha. nineteen and a half percent interest number is an artifact of the of the eighties and stuff that the that the uh, Federal Reserve." was doing with the supply of money okay. to try and control inflation. So anyway, that's oh, gotcha. the lecture gotcha. for today. Well, and no, but what, basically what you're saying there, Todd, is that unfortunately, like that is a, the numbers about that times 25 and the 4% living uh, 
of your investment kind of piece is all based on if all things continue along your planned path. And you have to understand that as long as you're willing to accept that there's flexibility you need, then you should be able to adapt the plan in real time. And because in a way, one of the good arguments I heard back was, you know, because I started presenting pokes and questions about how well these plans hold up, is that, yeah, but if you're not doing a plan of any kind anyways, this plan gives you something to work towards. And then like anything in life, if something catastrophic happens or whatever, it's going to change regardless of what plans you have now. Or right. Can, so can, I, so. can I interject slightly there and just to say people should not have the mindset of if anything happens because that's a, that's a you can that's a gamble, right? Instead, you should look at it statistically of, of throughout your life, right? Throughout your life, how many times have you had a financial disaster? Nothing necessarily major, but like the washing machine broke, my car broke, uh, my dog needed surgery. Any well, of these things. Statistically, throughout your life, it'll happen every few years. Arguably, that's why having a, a arguably you add that into your plan, right? You you add that that ability yeah. for minor things. It's the idea that no matter what plan you have, something can happen beyond your constraints. And in that sure. plan, you know, it you can only go so risk risk adverse before your plan really isn't even a plan. And so that, that those kind of thoughts, anyhow. But yeah, so real life world stuff that yes, as uh, Sir Pencer said in the chat, um, essentially that you know interesting subject for us old folk. But I will throw on top well, of that, I... you become more aware of it the older you get. The yeah, sooner that yeah, you yeah. pay attention to it, the easier the and better. the further ahead by leaps and bounds because of the way that yep. money compounds and interest and everything, you are. When you get there. So it's one of those, if you can start now, no matter what age you are, if you aren't already involved, for sure. one of the best things you can start doing is paying attention to your finances and planning for how they're going to benefit you later in life. So, yep, uh, a mental, very quick mental exercise called the rule of 72. You take the rate of return on any investment, divide that rate of return into 72, and that number, the resulting 72 divided by the rate of return is the number of years it takes that money to double. Oh, interesting. So if you that take an investment account that makes 10% or even use round numbers 12% per year, right? the money that you originally invested will double every six years. Now run that through, run that through a 30-year scenario starting with 1000 bucks, right? And every 1000 bucks that you put in is its own thousand bucks that also subscribes to the rule of 72 and will do the same thing. Right. Thus, so thus you get the curve it, that actually like, you know, scales yes, up over the time. The exponential is, curve, the, the two to the N, the two to the N curve. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, so just, just, can I, can I just throw a spanner in the works of all this and say, uh, of course I, I have an adverse opinion on retirement and for, for not for everybody, not for the world. I don't think the world should do what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> I I don't have much faith in capitalism, in the establishment, and in uh, our financial bubble that we have in the West staying the way it will be when, when I'm an old man, right? Okay. I, I don't trust that in the next 60 years that I, I will have the same options that are available today, just like how most people today don't have the same benefits that are around 60 years prior to now, right? Um, as, as Octo was saying. Um, and my, my opinion is that I don't want to have any savings in money. I want to own things that will generate income for me instead. I don't want to trust my money to some any other kind of organization, be it a pension, be it a company with a pension, private or otherwise, public, social security, any of that. I am taking all of the money out that I can. And I'm going to invest it, not necessarily in, in stocks because I don't trust that crap either. I'm thinking property because people always need a space to sleep. And I think that's the safest <laughs> thing that I can do. Uh, so I, I'd like when I retire to have a few homes where there's a bunch of people who rent and they pay me every single month. And so that way, you know, slumlord no Ken. Have an income. So yeah. Ken, I'll, I'll simply let you know that there was a period of time in the late 19 teens where a bunch of people had a bunch of property one day. Uh, the country went red, shall we say. And those people didn't own their property anymore. 
So this is true. Somewhat, sar- somewhat sarcastic. Well, I was going to say there is a level that, especially in the United States, it can be argued that you really have trouble owning anything in the U.S. That's the truth. There's yeah. some hook. True, but <laughs> if we're concerned about that, I mean, I'd, I'd be much more concerned about money that's literally not in your hands, right? Uh, that's fair enough too. But there, there is something to what you're saying, right? And and not to make this overly academical or too much of a lecture, but this is one of the topics that I'm fascinated about. The central banks of the United States and Europe have have essentially showed you their hand, mm-hmm. right? The European Central Bank is pumping $75 billion a month into the European Union's economy until further notice, right? And the Fed is doing something similar until further notice. So what you essentially have is you have the central government, the central banks of two of the three biggest economies on Earth that are just dumping liquidity into the system every month for apparently the rest of time. So what does that mean? The corollary of that is get rid of all of your short-term debt because the interest rates on it are going to be low. Inflation is always going to be low. So you can't, you can't use inflation to eat away at some of that debt because you took the debt in the past. Yeah. Right. And you have more money in the future in part because of inflation. So um, there's not going to be, there's not going to be high inflation ever again. So that debt is just going to sort of sit there like a brick and it's going to be a pain in the ass to, to pay off, but you'll be able to roll it over forever because interest rates are going to be low, structurally low um, for the foreseeable future. So the idea being that, you know, that there's going to be a giant money pump be it Europe, be it North America, to get rid of all of your short-term debt. You can hold on to the long-term stuff, especially the long-term stuff that has fixed interest rates, um, and acquire assets. Yeah. Gotcha. And that's it. That's that's the that is what that is what the um the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank um have have told you you have to do gotcha. because well, you're not no, going to get you're not going to get wage growth you're you're not if you look at it very since 19 since 1979 wage growth for the bottom 80 percent of everybody has been flat or negative right so, yep, yep, no, yeah. that is that is a very important note that people but again what you're talking about right it's all about you're doing it from a much deeper perspective todd of check history and trend and inform what's happening now to see how to plan future um, versus kind of where we're just talking that light level yeah, initially of generally good it, ideas. Yeah. It's data analysis and game theory. Right? Yeah, it, it entirely is. Yeah. Which um, what better place? Nature, right? Well, but what I better think... place to apply that than your actual life and your financial future? Sure. Right. Oh, For sure. all those things, uh, if nothing else about is, what we do with gaming to yeah. bring it to real life. Yeah, and it's absolutely human nature as well because, okay, think about all the things people have invested in the past few hundred years that have become big trends and been worth it. I mean, right now, I think tech companies are an obvious thing to invest in because they're just on the up and up, right? Every tech company has, even especially over COVID, look at Amazon, right? $72 billion Bezos made since the start of COVID. That's, That's an insane figure. That is absolutely ridiculous. Um, I think if you if you have, have the money to invest there, you, you that's a good idea. Another one is probably Bitcoin at the moment. It looks like that's I've, I've heard from a few people as well in in uh, research that they were saying, yeah, I'm probably going to be putting a chunk of my my retirement into Bitcoin in the next few months. I was like, oh, okay, right, that says a lot. I mean, if you're going to take your retirement for it, that that must be <laughs> that must be something important. Um, but for me, like I said, I I don't know if I trust Bitcoin myself. I don't know. I don't necessarily trust tech companies not to do anything dumb, and I don't necessarily trust that the the environment that the, that the U.S. is right now, with the way that, we're, for example, banning TikTok, banning WeChat, um, the look of privacy issues, uh, and the, the instability between the left and right that we're seeing right now. I don't know what's going to happen with tech companies in the near future. I don't think anybody really does. Sure, innovation is going to be constant, and therefore, there, you know, there's going to be more things to make money. Um, 
But I, in the end, I still go back to the old trust and the old faithful of what do people always spend money on? It's going to be food, water, and shelter, and 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 prostitution. But let's not go down that route. <laughs> well, but if you can combine all of those, then you've got your yeah, investments like done. The, a brothel where we charge rent and, uh, you know, we sell food at a restaurant, like a gourmet restaurant brothel. A large enough establishment to have my self-sustaining garden on the top of it that is all, you know, ego, you know, right. like you're friendly. And a part of it is residential that always has a tenancy. But then you have the short term rental other side of it. And you have some of your tenants on one side who work on the other side. So it's all cyclic and internal. And then they can, in addition, help resolve against some of the costs by tending the garden on the top as part of the oh, labor okay. thing so like, to buy down on the cost of their rent or to up the percentage of return on the job on the side. So I'm, prostitute I'm, so, I'm sorry. Garden. I'm sorry. The top 10 floors of this building are reserved to the guests of bad corp and sack corp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this anyway, is so bad. that was uh, an interesting uh, the conversation. Future of, we, yeah, we, the future of VTW Productions is... Uh, so, <laughs> after speaking of where we are in live today, let's get back to a few things that happened previously because we have had some great interfacing from all of you yes. out there watching. So we have some emails we want to get to. And I want to make sure we did this before getting into the main part of the show that we will do by the top of the show because I didn't want to let these go before uh, you know, they get too old, essentially. So uh, starting top. Top of the list, and Ken, I don't know if you're logged into the email or not. And so I'm and... not. Please just go ahead, sir. Okay. So we got three in here. Uh, you're going to hear my voice far too much, people. Here you go. So we have a first one that came back, and this is more an anecdote side note from our friend John Wasik wanted to tell us a bit about one of the games he's been playing, which is Assassin's Creed Syndicate, because he and his wife have been going through and basically playing all of the Assassin's Creed games and wanted to give you guys a bit of their impression as they go through the series. So his email right. in today says, hey, guys. Last week, and so this would have been like two weeks ago, we started playing through Assassin's Creed Syndicate with much trepidation. Assassin's Creed Unity was a disaster, and frankly, it was frustrating control-wise. While boasting a beautiful recreation of Paris, Unity suffered from controls that were at least as bad and buggy as Assassin's Creed 3. I was excited because they added new parkour controls for what was supposed to be more precise controls, only to have the protagonist, Arno, uh, sometimes do exactly the opposite of what I wanted him to. The most frustrating aspect was that they wanted his walking to be realistic. If you walked, or if you're walking one direction but need to go the opposite, he walks around in a circle to change directions, making precise movement impossible. There were also missions that you could start even before you had the appropriate skills to actually complete it. Side stories, not main story, thankfully. Story wise, it was interesting when I could follow it. No, I mean, even during cutscenes, random crowd members would talk so loud that I couldn't hear what the main characters were saying. You really need subtitles turned on it's for this reason. Realistic. <laughs> it's very realistic. Which I, which I found out later. The biggest improvement Unity had from Black Flag, there was a definite ending in the story, whereas Black Flag just was like, okay, what next? Uh, or, oh, you have a daughter now? The end. What? Syndicate, however, fixes many of those control bugs. Well, uh, <laughs> including, and eh, it's been a while, including the walk in a circle problem and the parkour controls work much better for most of the time. There was a lot of interesting ways to engage bad guys via stealth and fighting is very unique. Jacob favors brass knuckles and Evie favors a cane with a hidden sword. And it's almost comical to have her whack guys grab them with the cane handle, bash them with her knees, then pull the sword and finish them off. Honestly, I'm not disturbed. Story-wise so far, I'm enjoying it. And the twins are extremely entertaining with their banter and carefree attitudes. All in all, Syndicate is, so far, a fair superior game to Unity. Overall, however, AC2 remains my favorite of the entire series. This one may be a contender. We shall see. So that as a quick bit of a uh, review, if you will, from our friend John. Very very much so. It was Venice, right? Which one? Oh, man. Uh, I think uh, it was so. Assassin's Creed 2 Venice. Oh gosh, I forgot. I've not played that in years, man. <laughs> I know it's, it's like, man, how long has <laughs> it been? Old. Well, no, so it's bad. Some giggles, one of it, and so we've got uh, uh, I think Origins and Odyssey. I think o oranges, yes. Oranges. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, Dragon Age oranges. Yep. Um, 
Yep. Uh, I splashed around a little bit. The level gating to me was kind of meh. Okay. Um, but I mean, they're, they're fun enough. They're stealthy, stealthy, missiony, open worldy, questy, questy games. Which you know, yeah, I, I, I heard fun. the game better fine. recently. I've, I've heard post past post Black Flag AC's gotten a lot better. Yeah, I, I don't. I I had to never played Black Flag, so I don't know. But I mean, these are perfectly serviceable games. It is, there are a million. There are a million of those open world missiony type of games out there. Like for sure. I don't know. To to me, the I don't know what it is about Japan that changed the formula for me. But there was just something about something about Japan. Like, it made me interested again, whereas even Ancient Greece, which I was surprised by, was just like, uh, this world is this world is enormous, and I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, it just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a good answer for that. That's actually a quite interesting show topic, is um, era-based era games and how to make them good, because... I know when I played, I played a few games. For example, uh, Far Cry, um, Pri- Primal, I think it's called. Um, oh yeah, I couldn't get into it. I feel like that was a very poorly made version of a medieval game. Um, I-, I feel like it was just wasn't like there's a lot of weapon mechanics that you can use, like I don't know, different types of arrows that have different effects, and maybe magic systems and stuff to make it kind of more enjoyable, more complex. Um, because obviously, if you play something in the modern day, you can have a hell of technology in it, right? So that's that's the difference. Um, and throughout the era, you you can have different types of weaponry. Like if you have um, you can have steampunk kind of stuff, right? Which has its own unique type of weaponry and gadgets and such that you can play with. Um, I think that could be a really interesting discussion we should have sometime. The, the different eras of video games. Uh, there's some interesting levels of what kind of gameplay you can get in different time frames and environments, and some seem to absolutely meet better than others. Um, so sure. in addition, so yeah, no, uh, talking about kind of the Assassin's Creed series, which I haven't played for a minute, although I think I, I like, I finished playing the U S one, which was that three. Um, and then got in and then I got black flag, which I heard great things about the naval combat from, but I never actually played it and I haven't touched any since. Um, but I remembered enjoying the heck out of the originals back in the day. Um, so mm. it's something I've always kind of wanted to get back to at some point. Uh, in addition, I never enjoyed the PC ports. Oh, I can't. Mm, I guess I haven't really. Pl- no, I played. Yeah, no, I played uh, the US one on PC, but I used a controller. So it was basically, as far as I was concerned, right. the same game. It, Assassin's Creed's one of those game styles that I don't think is keyboard mouse needed. And so it's comfortable to sit back and play con- with a controller, which I think gets into um, a lot of how things are played. From from what I remember of playing the the I think it was either number one or number two on PC, I remember it was had, had that crappy Xbox 360 uh, Windows Vista, maybe seven uh, integration. Well, that, there were okay, like you know, it, there's it, a whole other conversation. Tell you the computer controls, it would say press X, press Y. And there's press a whole B. other issue like, of games what? coming over, yes, as well as ones that heaven forbid came from like the Microsoft Store, what was originally back then the Xbox Store on Microsoft. And oh, the man, issues that came awesome. from all that. And when you'd hit like the Xbox button, how it opened it, its overlay. And it's like, no, I don't want the Xbox experience on my PC. Um, uh, I don't want a bad, bad imitation of the Xbox experience on, on PC. Imagine trying to do the parade scene in Final Fantasy VII with a Logitech Xbox controller. <laughs> that doesn't have square, oh. triangle, circle, and X. Oh man, the number of times because I primarily play with an Xbox One controller on my PC as my you know mm-hmm. it's just really comfortable and solid build. Sure, but because I've been playing through some Nintendo IPs and the way their absolute ass backwards way of any kind of control scheme works. Yep. Oh my gosh, if it's just like, well, let me just forget what anything says, and it goes back to there's a meme. I've seen on social media for years about why when people say like press X gamers are always like nervous or something like, ah, you know, just hit X because you, it shows every different controller that's at X in different places and how nobody could come to a universal perspective, let alone, like I said, the Mm -hmm. problem I have with Nintendo is their default for accept is the right most button, not the bottom button. And Uh, default for cancel is the bottom. So they're flipped from like, 
everyone else except for yeah, old right. Sony. Like old Sony that came over direct from Japan was the same way, where it wasn't X to to select; it was or it was Circle to select and X to cancel. And so anyone who did that was just bizarro world to me. Like <sighs> just the bottom one for except it's the easy one; it's right there. And so, ah. but <laughs> that's it. Reminds me of that playing with different controls. All right, I do have another email coming in, and this one's coming in from our friend Ionis, and he warned. As this, I believe, is his sixth edition of this email before he sent it. Um, and that it is its own mini wall of text. But this one's coming in as it says, about Metacritic, review bombing, and a few other random things that happen to find their way here. So, I know this comes in saying, initially a little caveat saying he recommended I look through and edit. and so, but No, too bad, you're getting raw. Uh, let me start by saying... I don't think there's any fail-proof way to stop review bombing on sites like Metacritic, IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, or any other of the other free-for-all review aggregates. And on principle, I'm not always against the idea of review bombing as a form of consumer protest. The core issues I have with sites like this, that is a lie. That there is a virtual or virtue, excuse me, of giving everyone a voice. The moment someone who has no business speaking on the topic opens his mouth, your own voice inherently loses some of its value. You write a measured one like thousand word review over or after completing the game and score it at a 76. And some Joe Schmo who just heard the game has a gay character goes and rates it zero out of 10 boring AF. Guess what? The game now has a score of 38. Congratulations. Steam, on yep, the other that's hand. That's a good point. Not only requires you own the game, but shows exactly how many hours you've played said title. When I'm interested in purchasing a game, I always look for negative reviews with over 20 hours of playtime. I often find those reviews to be the most helpful in making an informed decision. Principal ideas in which I would uh, find review bombing justified is in the case of gross breach of consumer trust. For example, introducing predatory microtransactions two months after the premiere of a game after all the reviews are already out. Whoa, is that a dig at EA? Well, Diablo 3. Oh gosh, the whole like the whole like wave of Diablo 3's introduction continuation to where it finally got to a de- decent place. Um and so yeah, that's a that <laughs> that's a good example of how things your yeah, review can change was, over uh, time. That was a whole thing. That was a controversy. In, oh yeah, entirely, well, right? microtransactions, the real real money auction house, the like all the various things that Blizzard continued to do <laughs> to say, look, let's take every means we can to pull money from you, including having you buy something at retail price off the shelf. Like, wow, Blizzard, have you found every way to charge people money? Yeah, so, that was uh, that was disgusting. Uh, continuing, it's a uh, okay. What I would actually want, however, is for people to put their money where their mouth is. If you feel Naughty Dog did a poor job with The Last of Us 2 for whatever reason, and you go out there and write a bad re- how bad Last of Us 2 is, and then with when Naughty Dog announces new Uncharted, you line yourself up in the hype train to pre-order it. If you become that whiny WoW forum member who for 15 years screams, the game is bad because I don't have what I want, I cancel my subscription, and wait a week or two, or and yet pre-orders the deluxe edition of every expansion and has all the in-store pets and mounts. Wait a week or two. Let reviewers you trust play the game and give their first impressions. Just wait. It's not like you don't have any other games to play meanwhile. Ooh, that's me. <laughs> uh, on the topic of politicizing games, more often than not, I find it muddle or muddies the water for many people when it comes to the correct evaluation of the title. Would I get rid of uh, get rid of it? No. But would I like both journalists and gamers alike to judge a game without their local social political bubble glasses on? Imagine a flat earth society going on Metacritic and mass review bombing Kerbal Space Program for prom- uh, promoting the globe lie. It doesn't say anything about the game itself, how buggy it is or how many options you have when constructing your spacefaring apparatus, uh, how much replayability there is. There are certain objective facts that should be taken into consideration when reviewing a title. The opinion on the shape of the earth is of secondary, if not tertiary, importance. <laughs> this goes back to my original point, though, right? It, like, Yeah, I agree that the average person probably doesn't give a crap what the Flat Earth Society has to say about the Kerbal Space Program. However, 
if you are of that minority who's a flat earther and you want to see a review on the game, it should be customized to your viewpoint. It should say, well, people like you have given it 0%. <laughs> so you probably won't enjoy this game. Well, it should it's all the, be personalized. It's the like, don't you play Kerbal, always play a Civ game because that at least represents everything flat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good point. But, but uh, <laughs> continuing on, I notice this. The reviewers. On the one other side, you have those so-called mainstream reviewers. I loathe their opinion almost as much as the random Joe Schmoes. In theory, having an aggregator of reviews from different outside outlets is a great idea. In practice, however, the moment such data becomes of any relevance, there is a host of small, well-educated, and equally well-paid people think-taking how to corrupt the system for their benefit. And the playbook how to do it is out there for years, and this email is already too long to get into details, but let me give you one example. I went to Metacritic and compiled some information about the FIFA series that came out in the last five years on all major console and PC. I want you, the chat, to guess how many percent of those reviews were negative. So I'll give you guys a do 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 for like 10 seconds. Well, say the agree. question again for people who didn't know this it, call it is, to action. Say again. Is how many percent of those reviews were negative in the past five years of uh, the FIFA series of games? Oh, that's uh, something I'm quite unfamiliar with. Um, I, I, I would be a so soccer, soccer fans are passionate. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess it's at least sixty percent negative. At okay. least. Okay. I want to say ninety eight percent positive, two percent. Okay. Negative. So Whatever and Ionis is in chat or was last time I looked. So hopefully you can correct or fill in a bit on this if I get this off of it. But you say. Out of 577 reviews, 497 were positive, 86.14%. 80 were negative with a 13.86%. And it says, like, not a single review was negative. So I'm not sure that piece, Ionis, you need to help me with. Is that that? Oh, rating versus wrote? review, probably. So if you just yeah, the stars versus, versus if you write something. That's what I'm wondering. So you might need to keep me with that. Uh, and then he said, off topic, the cake. For best meaningless word salad of FIFA 2020 reviews goes to Hardcore Gamer with their impressively vague, quote, EA Sports has spent plenty of time revamping the microtransaction-filled ultimate team mode since its introduction, but that has come at the cost of making the FIFA franchise fall short of becoming the definitive soccer experience both in multiplayer and single player. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, I think the problem with any any sports games is that they're all owned by like single, you know, corporations. It or is unfortunate or that it, it seems that most sports games have been reduced down to a single franchise per sports type. In most yeah. cases, so if, you don't if, have if a you lot have of diversity. Review, people are still going to buy it because there's no alternative, right? It's <laughs> a monopoly. Well, and so what? It, it's the uh, it's the tech mobile problem. In the so that- back in the back in the day, you had specific players who had their own branded football games, <laughs> and if they didn't get the NFL license, the only person who used their real name was the was the person who was branded, who who had the branded game. Right. So then, when a non-specific NFL licensed game comes out. And you can't use Joe Montana because Joe Montana has a branded football game. You get something like QB Chiefs, yes, or or QB Forty Niners in your QB Eagle <laughs> uh, that everybody knew was Randall Cunningham and who ran like Randall Cunningham, but you couldn't say Randall Cunningham for uh, copyright yep. reasons. Yep, that's your weekly tech mobile reference. No, I, I hated that aspect with so many of the sports games and why like college football and college sports in general always had the just name or no names and just like jersey numbers and stuff where you're like, come on, you know, those kind of things. Yep. Yes. To finish up the email, he says, so no, I reject the idea that aggregators provide accurate information by canceling personal bias. If anything, they show the industry wide biases. And a long list of half lies doesn't equal the truth. In conclusion, I think the importance of the sites like Megacritic should be diminished or diminished. They should be seen for what they actually are, a compilation of unverifiable statistical data from various sources, data that does n- doesn't necessarily answer any question a consumer should ask before purchasing a product or if the game is actually good. When that happens, you can have so all it, the review bombing you want and no one would care 
You won't have internet uh, busybodies doing 10, was it 10 M 11s videos commenting on people having an opinion on the internet. If there's a piece of legitimate news we're sharing, I think somewhere along the line, we forget the open waters of the internet aren't a place for measured discussion. We're not conditioned to handle the social media infested infant dopamine gratifying press here for larger penis global village. We live in that for my onus. Thank you very much for the very well phrased email. <laughs> you you gave, if nothing else, a very, uh, as was mentioned in the chat by uh, Suprensa, or quoting the whole meaningless word salad kind of comments in there that I think we will take with us. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, no, appreciating hearing, hearing your thoughts on our discussion about review bombing and the impact of reviewers and what we need to do. Todd, you were saying, or it looked like you were going to. Oh, I know. I, so I, I was going to say, like, in the ideal world, the enthusiast media would just go away and we would use YouTube. But then I remembered that game YouTube also is crap. So uh, <laughs> we're we're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. No, I still like so the I, idea I of don't... some level of did you buy the game? Did you play the game now? Let me see. And oh, what games do you primarily review high versus low? Because if I have oh, some what, like that, I can at least base my thoughts on what's near mine. Here's what I've never understood about any enthusiast media. You have these people that are part of the enthusiast media who clearly are faking it when they say they love, in air quotes, video games. And, and listening, to the, listening to the way that they write about video games, it's, it's clear they don't want to be there. There are... <laughs> there are a thousand people that would beat that person's ass for that spot and there was a period of time that i was one of them which is why i went to work for uh why i went to write for tech raptor and because uh, i wanted to uh, you know in part because i wanted to find out if i could write about technology and video game things um and uh, you know i i i <laughs> I, I see all these people who don't take it seriously, who don't want to uh, apparently don't want to be in the spot except to except to promote the crap of their friends. And, <laughs> yeah, right. And they yet, want to get some money. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and it's just like, you know, you don't understand. Like, you know, I, I could play the first half hour of Doom or or the first 20 minutes of Cuphead. Like after twenty minutes of Cuphead, I might find out that Cuphead's not my jam. Yeah, right. Yep. And it's just you know this is too this is too precise for me. This this particular brand of bullet hell game is not not what I'm into. Yep. Right. And and phrase it that way, like as a personal, um, you know, as a personal matter of taste. You know what? That's a good point. I don't think I've ever actually seen a single gaming review this starts with just so you guys know i don't really like this type of type of game so my review is probably meaningless <laughs> well in a way right Sorry, it's usually like either game, well right? because if you say that they're basically saying so don't read my review yeah but you then, know in, in general the right. only reason someone would still read your review is if they trust you as a reviewer and you they believe they you have very similar tastes and therefore they may take it and say like well actually i tend to play all the same games you do and feel the same way so why wasn't this your kind yeah. of game? Okay, then I'm going to walk away from it. I would love for that level of honesty in anything, right? Any reviewing. Right. It's almost like a discussion of just any telling of stories and anyone who tries to present themselves as some kind of um, expert or you know, a person who has the credentials to fully encompass a description of something to say like, this is how something is, is that very few people have the full experience. And so it would be one of those things to say, as long as you're coming from a, a position of, and here is what my experience is. So take it with that understanding. I think we'd be so much better off across the world. Instead, you have people be like, Nope, this is crap because darn it. It's all, you know, it is not this my game. My review is entirely objective. There is no subjectivity. This is the truth of the game. And I, I hate that viewpoint. It's, it's ignorant as hell. It, it is a challenge. All right. Anyway, we have got an hour without talking about our topics. Okay. I have more emails I want to get into, but let's talk topic. And then if we have time, you know this we'll is, come back. This is show tradition. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. And I know. The first 90 minutes doing cleanup, and it's like, oh, crap, we have a topic, actually. Well, no, but that's good. How many emails do we have, sir? One more email? We have three more. but Well, two more, really. Oh, my God. And they're, they're, well, the, let's do one more today and save two for next week. Well, the other one we have is Story vs. Gaming. Is is a response on that that has some uh, depth to it. And then we have another one talking about uh, one she from... Was small one. A we can do a small one. I can do a small one. So I'll do the one that just came in from Happy Dude. All right. And this one says, so here's the situation. And I apologize because the other one is from Shadow Vice. And, but it has some, some depth to it. Uh, it says, I have yeah, heard. So that's somewhere between J.R.R. Tolkien and Brandon Sanderson is my guess. <laughs> <laughs> he has put some thought. The of time number four, I get your reference now. Hey, good for you, good. Hey. Yeah. Oh, All right, so, so happy, dude. I have a hard time trying to figure out what to play at times, and I figured out the worst thing to do while picking a game. The backloggery is where you post your gaming collection and your process and your process through them. If you have any issue picking something to play, there's a fortune cookie part of the site that you can have games chosen for you at random. It chooses three games, and I decide to put it to a vote to my 800 Twitter followers. The game cho- chosen at random were the following. Devil May Cry 4, Final Fantasy X2 Remastered, and Final Fantasy 7. And cur- currently, with 50% of the vote being to DMC4, it is in the lead with one day to go. But what I'm really glad about was that the uh, cookie didn't give me the crappy DMC reboot that no one liked. <laughs> so here's a, uh, he provides a link to what is he playing and why. And so he wanted to oh, pass this on. For his Twitter, if you wanted, if anybody wanted to help contribute to the poll on what Cupcheck is going to play next, and so like I, I would put that. Hammer that with the drop in, and then it's just like, yeah, I put it to a vote as to what I should play next because I didn't know what it was, and I was like, that's as <laughs> reasonable a discriminator as anything, for yes. sure. Right? <laughs> yeah. That, well, at least it, at least it did the like. To be honest. I, I like the idea of that, though, in that, and especially for anyone who streams, it kind of makes sense to put out there, here's my game catalog and the ones I haven't touched. Of you who actually take any moment out of your day to watch what I play, what would you like to see yeah. me play next, right? Hey, that absolutely makes sense. That's a good idea. All right, so we will yeah. save Shadow Vices so that we can get into today's topic, which is to talk a bit yes. about the upcoming console wars, if there are any. So, everybody, we know that both Sony and Microsoft have announced consoles that are going to be released this holiday season. And hopefully, as you're watching, us being gamers as a whole, I know that while we lean heavily towards PC gaming, we all have cut our teeth on consoles and I think continue to look for them and find any titles that we think might be compelling as well as any systems that will provide an experience we enjoy. I know, Ken, you really appreciated a lot of your time with kit features on console and things like that. And I think, Octel, you've had Serium with... Or, uh, bleh, You've had similar with Mistress of Giggles that you found like some of the real advantages to spending time on the console and not just on PC um, and such. So to start talking about some I, of these things or Ken, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I, 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 I'd like to go into this with a wholesome message because, I, you know, what? I, I, as much as I am PCMR in the sense that I do prefer using PC or PC for my personal gaming or gamer gaming platform of choice. I want to put the wholesome message of I support all who game. And if you game in any format, I think that's awesome. And you are welcome in our community. Be you a Switch user, uh, an original Wii user, a DS, Xbox, PlayStation, Dreamcast, iPhone, uh, whatever. Right? Um, we're, we're all together against Mac users. No, I'm kidding. I'm actually a <laughs> Mac user anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so, you know, we're going to be talking about the consoles and which one we think is, is better. And also we're going to talk a little bit with Stadia and any other streaming platforms that are, that are there to stream your games from other sources. Um, and, and also we're going to, inc- of course, include PCMR. I mean, like if we're going to be looking at consoles, we should discuss whether it's, you know, whether the, the, the default choice of, should I just stick with PC or should I consider buying a console as well as for instead and, of? And here's, and here's the problem because you kept all of your games. Cause you're a hoarder like me. Uh, you kept all of your games from whenever, whichever company had the better console generation. Mm-hmm. 
You have to buy both. <laughs> potentially, Ooh. potentially. Two, two word friends, backwards compatibility. But it all yes. depends on how that comes apart. So to get into this discussion, let me let you guys know we're going to at least mention some of the obvious similarities and differences between the two primary ones coming up, the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, and that is the specs. We already know in general that you have their own ecosystem systems and their own um, back catalog and general thing of the IP they have and what's attached to them and what they support. So I want to get into a little bit of what it is they each provide when we're looking at just the hardware specs and what we know so far. So... What we know so far is that they're basically both running the same CPUs out there, which is AMD-based 8-core uh, Zen 2 processors. Now, they're running them at slightly different specs. The PlayStation is going 3.5 gig. The Xbox Series X is 3.8, as well as I believe on each of these, when I mentioned the core rates, the PlayStations are going to be running at, one of them is at fixed and one of them is at variable. And so, but I thought it was a PlayStation. PS5 is variable. Yeah, it's variable. Mm -hmm. So while it does to have, tech radar. and I've seen that in multiple places, that in while they may have, you know, it's it, some of that's negligible. Honestly, 300 megahertz difference in a gigahertz battle is not massive, but it's there. Um, when it comes to a little more close or, or a little more numbers that kind of separate the GPU performance. Uh, on the PlayStation 5, they're going to be running, again, they're both running AMD RDNA 2 processors, but the PlayStation 5 is running at a variable 10.3 teraflop performance, and the uh, Xbox is at a 12 terabyte uh, teraflop, so about a 2 teraflop difference there. Um, a, what, 20% difference, if you will. And... There's a potential there. Can we get, a, can we get a, gra a, a graph of the specs? I've got a good website for it here, actually. I'll, I'll send it to you, Wayne. But can okay, we get a, I've had a, a graphic couple. here so we can actually all look at it together? Yes. There, there's see. a link to the website I was using. So that is what I've been using as well. The challenge I had is it keeps giving me a bit of noise as I do it. So I will share it. Um, here's where I'm looking at it as well. We also have 16 gigs of GDDR6 memory. See, I'm getting this page not responding thing. Stupid thing. Oh, weird. I'm not getting that. I think I've just had it uh, sitting idle too long. <laughs> I'll tell you it's, what. It's such, uh, but, no, I'll I, send you a but I still have it. Um, so with that, though, the... Can I just bring that up in the way I want? We'll see. I, you'll see it. Um, okay, I refreshed it, so hopefully it'll play nice. That, in addition, it's got the memory. They both have 16 gigs, but there's a slight difference there where one of them, the PlayStation has reserved memory where all 16 gigs is running at, I think, 480 um, what the throughput on it as a whole as such? Ah, screw it. I'll just leave that up. The uh, whereas or eight gigabytes per second is that what you're talking about? Bandwidth? Yeah, memory bandwidth. Bandwidth. The bandwidth for the memory on the PlayStation Five is going to be the same across all 16 gigs. Where the I believe the Xbox is reserving part of it. I, there's like yep. ten and six or something like that. Where ten gigs of it is running at five hundred something, and the other like six is running at lower speed of somewhere like 380. So there's a split. And gents, we, we, we are technical enough to understand this. Not all of our audience members are. Can we, can we explain what this means? Todd, what are your thoughts on the memory spec piece of it? Oh. Or did that? Did lose him? Oh, yeah, it's frozen. Well, he was, his will be back here shortly. technical difficulties and we'll be back momentarily. <laughs> um, so basically, from my under oh, there he is. My my basic understanding of it is that uh, the overall bandwidth for pushing it, they're trying to say that while the and one, another big one's the storage the SSDs, where Sony's going to have this 825 gig SSD that's custom and supposedly has massive bandwidth compared to traditional SSDs and anything on the market. The Xbox is going to have a full one terabyte, but it's traditional NVMe type SSD. So Sony is saying you're going to be able to stream faster directly from SSD and theoretically less to no loading. On the Xbox, they have faster memory, so once things are loaded up and in there, it should potentially perform better. And so a lot of the spec-wise going through it is kind of a tit-for-tat, back and forth. And I've heard arguing that in many cases, the Sony or the Series X, sorry, the Xbox, is eking out a performance gain, like it in does general. Look like it's it's, it's yeah. overall better, but it's so close, it'll be hard to say. Both are going to support same features of things like up to 8K gaming, up to 120 hertz. Um, FPS playback, 4K, Ultra, Blu-ray playback. So the screen will refresh extremely quickly and it'll look very fluid. Yep. 
Oh, well, we our people are smarter than that. <laughs> no, no. I, hey, uh, we welcome all gamers of all types, even if they don't necessarily. We're we're people who have all like made custom computers and stuff in the past, right? And we all work in engineering type fields. Let's not make any assumptions about all of our viewers, well, right? This is kind of an unfair advantage we're standing. In upon. essence, they will, both will provide very fast, very fluid gameplay um, across yes. the board. There was some potential eking out for the Xbox to have better hardware specs and maybe it'll get a little bit better performance overall um beyond that the kind of differences go into the architecture the pricing things like that right now we don't know the pricing of either it hasn't been announced there's been leaks and speculation but nothing confirmed right now there's a lot of talk around the 500 hundred dollar mark around both of them so we don't know we'll see oh i've heard i've heard higher than that as well i've, I've heard up to uh 700 to a thousand well, depending on one like, of the challenges is there's going to be variations of the console. We already know that Sony is coming out with a digital-only version that doesn't have the, the player in it, and that Microsoft's, the, there's rumor they may reduce or have a slimmed-down version at some point coming out for the Series X. But we, again, don't well, have let, all those let's specs. Let's talk about, the, when you're saying slim down, there's a reason that they might be interested in doing so. Uh, maybe not the, the, the Xbox, but I've heard that the PlayStation is a behemoth, right? It's, it's huge. This thing is going to take up space. Like, you may need to well, change your furniture around for this thing. No. So there's two sides of that. There's a difference in the visual of each. And I, I will share, because this screen I have has shows both, that the Xbox arguably looks similar to, like, the newer Mac Pros that had come out in their full desktop iteration. It's a big, like, I don't know, like almost like a subwoofer looking enclosure type thing in it. it it's yeah. kind of ridiculous. And I, that, I like them both. You know that I like them both. Well, so it's one has a form factor of being just very square. And so it depends on literally your dimensions and that's it. The Sony has a little more of a spaceship look, or I've seen a lot of things talking about it just i don't know everything looking like it fits in the portal universe kind of thing and such yeah. like that that has those aesthetics and it, so it has a neat look to it and it's kind of wavy and such and they've shown images of it standing up and laying flat i don't know for anyone else out there how you position your consoles i have a traditional television like entertainment center where everything lies underneath it with receiver gaming systems things like that so anything i would get would want to be flat laid um, I don't know if that hurts like the Xbox's heating because it looks like it all vents out the one side. And so I don't know if that's an issue um, where I think Sony has vents kind of all around it. Don't know, but that's just aesthetically, right? Um, but slim, like you said, on the Sony, it's just like the other version just slims down and takes off the little notch that it builds up for the um, player, for the DVD on it. With the Xbox, I don't know what that'll mean if it does. But both, at least in the Xbox, they're actually talking about it being a slightly less specced machine if it does that. So we don't know truth yeah. on co on cost. Arguably, again, the performance is going to be close. They're both going to have ray tracing. They're both going to op um, be able to take advantage of all the current things we're seeing in PC when it comes to graphics and such. So they should look really pretty either way. I think it's going to come down to when we talk about really the important aspects of it are what Todd already mentioned or kind of got into one in general was like your game library. What's coming out? Because we do know that there's going to be exclusives. And along so with that's that, a big part of the decision, right? It's a big part as well as it's the online experience, like your multiplayer, things like that. It's the stores that they provide and any kind of things that they each have little things, what it costs to play multiplayer to get on with like that. And for uh, things like the backwards compatibility, is a big potential one. And one of the X series ones are one of the ones that's kind of a, it only exists in one place. So it depends how important to you it is, is virtual reality because the PS five is going to likely, it says an almost, uh, almost confirmed support all old peripherals, including the PS VR. And so it has VR where the Xbox does not currently have anything shown that they will support VR in any way. So that's more of a bonus or side note that I'll at least give. That's a checkbox. Sony has that Xbox does not. And so, but that really depends on what for you as a gamer does VR mean? Well, right. that's the thing though, right? Like, unlike, okay, the, the main the main benefit I think most people can agree upon that consoles have over PC is that it's more, you know, couch co-opable or just couchable, right? You can attach your TV and chill out and turn on and have it as a remote that you don't need to touch or do anything else with. Whereas PC, generally speaking, there's more setup required, there's customization, there's more wires, there's keyboards, there's mice. And it, so that, that's the one advantage that really consoles have over this. So I don't necessarily understand 
what the purpose of having VR for a console is when you can hook up to a more powerful machine that can handle more stuff and you uh, and then you're going to go remotely anyway most likely like you know, I don't think people will use cables with their VR or would like to if they had the choice they'd rather do it wirelessly if they could um, so it seems unnecessary to me to go I would never make a choice for a console based on VR capabilities if I was interested in VR I'd be looking at a VR computer well, and that's the thing. I know a lot of people who, as PS owners, who do have the PSVR, love it. And for them, it's a wonderful experience. But there are also people who have not invested in a PC and VR PC gaming. So it, it has shown the numbers on VR on, on PlayStation are not insignificant. They are, there is a large number of units they have sold. Um, so it's like I said, there will be people hey, wow. that if they can continue to play VR on, the, on their couch. And, and I, honestly, there's a piece there because it uses just the move camera. And so it's basically a way better wireless type experience than most PC based, unless you have a, an Oculus. And so playing in your living room as a game space versus where your computer likely sits, if it's in an office or other space, most living room VR situations are going to have better space and things like that already built in. So I can, I can see the fun, but again, it depends on user and individual. I have VR. Most other from my friends don't, although more are getting it. So we'll see. Actually, there's, a couple in the chat that have it. Eh. Anyhow, so VR is just a case. Really, one of the things I come down to is we'll start with like exclusivity of gaming. What do you guys feel and where's your position on the importance of exclusive titles? Well, let's not discuss the ethics of it because I think we can all be pretty clear that we think it's a bunch of BS and marketing stuff and it's nothing to do with helping gamers out and it's got everything to do with no, making money. But it is so. the truth that these consoles each have their own exclusive titles. Because of that, is that, do you think, going to be a determining factor for a lot of consumers about what they buy? Todd, please go first. It probably will, but it shouldn't be. It rewards I, it, doesn't it? What's that? It rewards it, doesn't it? It rewards that, well, that uh, mindset. It, yeah, it does. Halo's not that good. It never has been for the, for the, the two humans out there. Um, I like Halo. Well, so here's the thing. I enjoy Halo, but regardless of that, I don't think if you were doing just a comparison in our situation of PC Master Race consoles, I don't think there's been a console-based FPS that's really good at all. I think they are good for the fact they exist on a console, but I can almost always point to significantly yeah. better experiences yeah. on the PC. Yes. Because every time yes. some plea yes. tells me that Goldeneye was somehow an amazing FPS experience, it I cry for even them. Even the best FPS of its generation. Because Quake 2, I'm sorry, let me, let me say that again. <laughs> it wasn't even the best console FPS of its generation because Quake 2 came out on PS1. It's better. It played better. The only it even had the four player uh, multiplayer, a four player uh, multiplayer. As long as you had a multi tap for PS One, which I did, so we were playing Quake One multiplayer on the PS One, and by the by, just better than GoldenEye. Well, just so in that situation, better. Yeah, I, I will forever go that console FPSing is quaint. Right. And it's, it's its own experience that is can be fun, but I will easily pair it against anything on the PC as being better. Fun, but so, inefficient. Yes. But so, so, yeah, worth, but there's the still so, around a little bit. It's, so you have things, and I'll just bring up a comment of some of the ones that I see on the quick list on the Tom's Guide about some of the exclusives we know. We know that as we'll start with the Xbox, they have Halo Infinite, pseudo exclusive, at least between the consoles. Sense was Saga Hell, Hellblade 2, which does look amazing. Forza Motorsports 8, because each console has its racing game. So I don't know if that matters because they each have their racing game. And State of Decay 3. And whereas key, and these are key, there's more exclusives, but key ones on the PlayStation 5 are things like Spider Man Miles Morales, which arguably the last Spider Man game was amazing on the PlayStation. People loved it. Her, uh, Horizon 2 Forbidden West, which everyone who played Horizon 1 loved that game. And so big you know push for two will probably be huge and then i'd say almost canceling out grand turismo 7 because that's just the racing game for playstation versus the racing game for you know a console which to me is like they're that tit for tat i don't think either one of them is better than the other in that sense 
Um, so racing games, I don't think there's an exclusivity that matters. Uh, when it comes to FPSing and such, you know, Halo has a whole series, so there's fanboys throughout. And if you've liked Halo, you'll likely buy the next. Um, the ones on Sony, yeah, I think, are a little more compelling in that they're games that could exist across platforms. You know, they haven't traditionally only lived in one place. And so I think that could be huge, at least for people who are fans. Uh, the challenge I have across any discussion about exclusivity is that unless you are that diehard fanboy for that one game, yeah, the majority of games coming out are going to hit both. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever gone out and bought a console specifically for one game? No. No. Never. That's the thing. I, I haven't. No, I, I haven't either. The closest I came was I bought my PlayStation 1 because I wanted a new console and I wanted the latest, greatest kind of thing. And I happened to buy Final Fantasy 7 and the original Tekken when I bought it, like the day I bought it. I didn't buy it because of, per se, but if I was getting a PS1, those two games seemed to match and they were an amazing experience, along with things like you know, when I got the first Gran Turismo and some of these other ones that were just so good. They're still on my shelf um, on my that I have here. And so, no. <laughs> uh, and that's the challenge. It's, it's one of my reasons, and this is a side to one of the discussion points that I have yet to buy and still don't own, a Nintendo Switch. Because while a lot of people play the heck out of that system and they like the portability, there's not been a single game that has said, darn it, I have to play that game, and therefore I'm getting a Switch. Like, the closest that came to was Breath of the Wild. But I'll tell you what, there's other ways to play that game, including it existing on the Wii U. So if you have access to the older system, which basically plays the exact same, you can play Breath of the Wild on the Wii U and get those for almost nothing. And so, yeah, I just, I, not for exclusive. It's a, it's a fair point. Uh, I, I, like taking, I like taking the Switch on business trips back when we were taking business trips. <laughs> um, it, because two hours on the airplane playing The Binding of Isaac is two hours well spent. Yeah, no, and that's right? like So would I have bought the console just for that? No. Was I pleasantly surprised and happy that The Binding of Isaac exists for Switch? Hell, yes. So, yeah, yes. I mean, I mean, there are there are games that have certainly tempted me as well. Uh, I, I've I've. I've seen sometimes the new consoles being like the the Fable one, right? That one's kind of got me my interest peaked. Would I dump half a grand for it? Basically, basically for a single game, I don't. I would not do that. I mean, you could argue that a lot of people did that with World of Warcraft, right? Because technically speaking, when you're paying twelve dollars a month, ten dollars a month, whatever it is, and you're getting the expansions and the base game over the years, a lot of people have spent like five to ten grand on one video game. When you think oh, of it that, way. people do it all um, the time. You know, back to all the way the people who still were playing EQ throughout, let alone if I even mm. want to bring it up because I'm a part of it, but not to the extent, you know, Star Citizen and things like that, where I know people who have spent, spent thousands of dollars on a game that's still in alpha. So, I mean, there, there's aspects of where you spend your money, whatever. But just so for I, it. I have to ask, Ken, do you, did, you not, uh, did you not participate in any of the Xbox generations? Like, did you not keep... Uh, Keep the old games libraries from any of them? Just out of so curiosity. I, I had an Xbox 360, and I got the Halos and stuff. and thoroughly enjoyed them. And then I moved on to PlayStation 4. Um, it was more for my wife, uh, because I had a new gaming PC at the time, and she wanted to have play games. And rather than us both sharing the same thing, she was happy to have a console, so that made sense, right? She could then have the living room, and I could have a different room. It was... Uh, and plus, it's more for couch games. She could like play Tekken with their other friends or play Skyrim and stuff like that, right? And it's, it's again that that one thing that co the console generally has over PC. Um, but no, in terms of game libraries, the only one that really matters to me is my Steam library. That's the only thing that I really want to keep. And I think that's okay. one of the big things that PC has as its biggest selling point. Um, and I think that's partly why Microsoft are so big on trying to get their store okay. to go ahead because they try well, to have the cross. The cross, uh, so library, let's right? so let's talk outside of exclusivity. At least for us, in our particular cases, you've heard that none of us are looking at a next gen console because of a game, right? And we've talked about some of the things we do appreciate, like the couch gaming and things like that. Outside of that, we talked about a previous library 
Todd brought it up about backwards compatibility. Well, best we know today about the potential for backwards compatibility of the consoles is it says, and this is from the article on, on Tom's Guide, it says both Sony and Microsoft have been very open about how backwards compatibility will work on their systems. At present, the Xbox Series X appears to have a more robust options, but there will be plenty of games playable on the PS5 as well. Microsoft has promised that every Xbox One game will be compatible with the Series X. Furthermore, they've said that smart delivery system ensures that if you buy an Xbox One game that is also available on the Series X, you'll automatically get the Series X version once you upgrade your console. And I think that's a really interesting place with what Microsoft's doing, meaning you don't have to wait, since we know it's coming this fall, if you already have an Xbox, that if you were to buy a game today that you know is also coming out, you don't have to yeah. wait to buy it. You can play it on both. That, that That's I, smart. I think since games are within the same ecosystem as their consoles and there's direct profits to be made by Microsoft or by Sony, that makes a lot of sense to have that kind of approach. I can see why they're hesitant to do it in the past because they don't want to have backwards compatibility to make sure that people buy the games again. That I, I understand the initial premise there. Um but in, in reality, I think keeping people in the people who have a PS3 are likely to get a PS4. People who have a four are likely to get a five, right? Eventually. There, so in, I think in if you general, encourage them to I stay agree. with the ecosystem and not transfer, that's now, the In general, I agree. You'll see a lot of people adopting the next generation. In addition, what's yeah. compelling about Microsoft is they said a handful of select Xbox 360 and original Xbox games will work with the system. And if they currently work with the Xbox One, those ones will already work with the new system. Uh, another one they're talking about with the Xbox is that while it runs many backwards compatible games better than the original system could, they've also committed to upscaling some of the favorite old titles, making them run at 4K resolution or up to 120 frames per second. Um, and they're not sure which ones will get that treatment, but that's something they're throwing. Mike, uh, Sony's a little less obvious with what they're doing. They said that they will have a univer uh, universalized software to run PS4 games on the PS5, so basically emulation. And that games that were optimized for the PS4 Pro will still have their enhancements in place. But because it's an emulation of it, they said it's not guaranteed to work in every title. They've also said that most of the top 100 PS4 games by playtime will run equally well on the PS5, and they have already tested that today. I did have an additional article that came out just recently, specifically about the PS5 backwards compatibility, that apparently a little bit more information came out. And that was saying that to do, they said that it's going out of its way to test PS4 games on PS5. It's not going to stop PS5 users from running any PS4 game on the console. In other words, the PS5 runs every PS4 game, although some may not work as well. So they're going through and testing specific ones and trying to optimize, but they're at least saying that it, 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 they're not blocking it from playing PS4 games that aren't optimized. And that's something good to hear, at least to some degree, because I've always hated how current generation backwards compatibility works, that so many of the titles are select. Oh, we're going to make sure this game works or that one. But heaven forbid, and this is, I think, speaking to more what Todd was bringing up, if I own the disc, one of my big mm -hmm. questions always for backwards compatibility is, can I push it into the console slot and have it play? Oh, that's God forbid. It. No, that'd be ridiculous. Well, but that's the thing. When I bought my PS3 at launch, I got the old school 60 gig at launch that had backwards compatibility built in for that reason. Because it had both the, it had the actual uh, emulation chips or whatever, the hardware chips of the PlayStation 2 and one in it. So it could render them by, at native rendering. And so I basically played my old a whole um, library. It was wonderful. And then after that, everyone's been like, eh. Yeah. And, I, and I struggle whenever they try to say compatibility is hard. I can understand with the most recent generation for performance, but anything older than that, if I can emulate it on a Raspberry Pi 4, yeah. then you got to be able to put it in as default capability to render every old thing you ever had on your new no, console. The, 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 the thing is, like, I get that from PS3 to PS4, they might not have thought of that. Right, That last generation, they didn't really consider it because they didn't really want to. They intentionally designed it so they didn't care, right? I, I, not, I don't agree, but I understand why that was difficult. But now they should have known from all the feedback that they got that four to five in this next generation leap, they should have been making every single game have a requirement that can, you know, meet the specs and be portable into the next generation. They should have had it from the, the, the base design, the construction of every single game should be on a platform that can be nicely well, packaged up and moved into the new I generation. I would say with the 
four to five, you get closer to that because they started running, basically, they're just running customized PCs. In the PS3, Xbox 360 generation, this Microsoft was already going that direction. Sony went, as it does, its completely own direction with its eight-core weird setup that everybody said was a ridiculously hard platform to program for because it didn't use any oh, of the yeah. classic or default APIs and such. So... I could see the challenge of some of them, but no, you're right. There should be, especially now, everything is developed on PC and everything's going to be run on PC. And especially, and if they're not, use the Unreal or the Unity engine, which scales it automatically for portable and for, if you want to cross-platform everything game, use those engines. They do it for yeah, you, right? I mean, the tools are there. They have been for forever, right? This is not a new thing. I don't know why this is still a discussion. I, and I'm, I'm actually kind of, I, I wouldn't just say upset, but I'm disappointed that they are still saying, oh, some games may not be available. Screw that, guys. That is that is pathetic, and at this stage, I believe, it's just laziness almost. I think Microsoft was closer on the list of what they're providing with X, with backwards compatibility. I had heard even rumor that they had teased going back to the first Xbox as being potentially available. Part of me says there's no negative for a company allowing their entire library to work. And it just annoys me that they put these somewhat false barriers in there because, you know, thank you, like Shadow Vice, Rock Band, Hatred on PlayStation. Uh, if, if I, you know, especially when you have games that aren't getting follow on titles, Rock Band being one, that instead of waiting to hope somebody does a port or something, just make it playable. Just let me plug my old, everything's a USB controller. Everything is just emulated anyways. It should work. And so I should be able to play the entire thing. There's, you're not going to be able to go and actually buy yeah, the difficulty, you can't, from Microsoft, right, go buy an original Forza 1 copy, if you will, from the store where they get paid for it. It's only used market. So enabling yeah, but the, that the, isn't okay, taking money the, the away from them. Is, they're not making money from backwards compatibility from sales. Absolutely, I agree. But they make money from backwards compatibility from all the nostalgia, the people, and the idea of it. I mean, if I was told, like, PS5... Say, say I was a big PlayStation fanboy, but I wasn't so sure we're getting the next console because I'd for whatever reason, right? If I was told, and all the previous games, all the way back to your childhood will work, I'd be like, that's so cool, and that shows that they care. I'd almost want to give them my money just because, I, I, I you know, that they're showing that they care for their customer. Run. Even if I had no plans <laughs> to actually play those games, right? It's just it's the fact that they're showing some level of of respect for their player base. Whoa, that whoa, is what whoa. I'm thinking. <laughs> Todd, what are your thoughts when it comes like to the backwards compatibility? Is either one of them showing a sense that they're doing it better, worse? Is any either one of those a check mark for you as to why that might be a better console for someone to try to make that choice? And the, that was why at the at the top I said you have to buy both, right? So I missed the PS3. I missed PS3. I went with an Xbox 360 instead, and I still have the entirety of my old library so if the series x is really going to play a bunch of or all of the xbox library that means all of my old arcade compilations for the xbox 360 when they were still putting them out you know that way like my williams arcade favorites <laughs> volumes one and two are going to be played that's a big deal my uh, Sega Genesis greatest hits compilation, so I don't need to. I don't need to dig the Genesis out of out of whatever crate it's hiding in. Three afternoons a year that I really just want to play Streets of Rage two. <laughs> yep. Right. I could just pop in the one disc, run through it in an hour, hour fifteen minutes, and be like, "Yep, that was that was exactly uh. what I was looking for." I, I I disagree. I think that what they could really do that would make a lot of sense is go further than backwards compatibility. And how, how much space do you think every single PlayStation 1 game takes? How much, like, literal storage space? Like, I don't know, 5 gig? 10 gig? They were on... They were, they were on modified CD that were, like, 800 megabyte or something like that, right? Well, they, okay, they, they more 800 than meg CD. Yeah, because Let's they had their own little gigs, proprietary though, right? thing. Um, yeah. The vast majority of these with a few hundred gig. Can they store? Can they just have a few servers with those games on them and say that if you subscribe to PlayStation Plus or whatever the the equivalent is for Xbox, 
Um, you know, you get access to all these PlayStation 3 and prior libraries, right? All of them. All of them DRM-free. You can stream or you can download. It's up to you as long as you have PlayStation Plus and a subscription or whatever. And uh, maybe upgrade it to get the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 games, right? But by default, if you just have PlayStation Plus, you get three and back. And then that way, all those old discs that you have, you don't have to worry about them. You can just play the game as you please. Because 98% of gamers will have the internet, right? So why not? Okay, sold. Well, I was going to say, that actually speaks to the next piece of this, which is PS5 versus Xbox Series X subscriptions. Because they do have, both of them have their subscription models. And right now, the PlayStation Now is Sony's game streaming service for a flat subscription fee of six was it six to $10 per month. Play, uh, players can stream and occasionally download a variety of PS2, PS3, and PS4 hits, up to and including the beloved exclusives like God of War from 2018. Um, and they're saying that they're ex- ex- they believe that will just expand, right? That they have their ecosystem of games and they have with it that you get a lot of those games just playable. Like, because you have a subscription, you can go back and play any one of those older games. Um, that makes sense. Microsoft, on the other hand, is Project xCloud. This game streaming service has been in beta for a long time, but will finally make its way to everyday consumers on September 15th. And if players subscribe to Xbox Game Pass Ultimate for $15 a month, They'll be able to stream Xbox games directly to their Xbox phones or tablets without having to use an Xbox contr- console as an intermediary. Um, save, Dave, save data carries over whether you play on console, PC, or mobile device, and Xbox Series X will almost certainly employ the same architecture. So there's a couple things in that. They both have uh, models where when you pay their subscription, they give you free games per month as long as you maintain a subscription. And they kind of just dole them out here and there. Um, as part of the joy of why you have a subscription. Oh, I never played Fable 2 or something. Here it is on the Microsoft Store, and you get it because you have a subscription. <laughs> and then there's the other pieces like um, what you're saying, and it's not quite that they're doing the entire library and everything's back there, but there's quite a bit, and I forget how many they say are in each one currently available. I've seen lists of hundreds in both cases. So there's a lot of titles you can play just for paying for their service. Now, there's a difference there. You have Those are both speculation and some of the in- information on their streaming, meaning what you said, Ken, they host the games, they're on a service, and you just use your console to play it. Um, that's super smart. I agree. They should be able to do it with their entire library. There's a slight difference there where Sony's is you play it to the console, what are your thoughts on both of you guys about that Microsoft piece that you can, because you have access to their streaming service, a bit more per month, but you can play it anywhere you stream. So you can play it on your console, on your PC, or even on a mobile device. So I don't, I don't understand the mobile device. I was against, I have been against trying to shoehorn game uh, pc games onto mobile devices from the beginning well so like, i don't i don't know if this me here's here's what i know here's what with the exception of a long duration plane flight right long duration being let's say two hours or more right so cross country usa transatlantic scandinavia to continental europe type of Sure. So, um, you can't get anything done in a game in the span of a bus ride around Oslo. Okay. You just can't. So yeah, I but... could have my I could have my head buried in the phone who walks onto the bus with a knife, or I could have my earbuds that would be listening to music and like my head on a swivel and be looking around and at least while I'm not getting the full sensory input of the world around me, which is the most important bit, I'm at least getting the visual I'm at least getting the visual input of the world around me. Now you know to each their own, like your mileage may vary and I realize that I am old so (laughs) I don't get it well, I get that well, let me let me throw a possibility at you, Todd, because I think the way I understand this is it's not that they're shoehorning the experience onto the, the device, like trying to manipulate it into you now play this as a console or as a phone or mobile game, but it's more just using the device as a display, right? A audio and display throughput because they're streaming the game. And so in most cases, I can see you still playing with a controller of some kind because I know a lot of that. Uh, you can get 
like Bluetooth controllers that let you attach to your device and play it like a full console. It was like the Switch. So and because I it's can speak streaming, a lot to that, I, I actually tried Fortnite with my uh, PlayStation Gun Pad on my phone, and it worked beautifully. Like it was, it was like playing on my Xbox or on, on my PlayStation, but now it was on my phone. Well, um, and, and the reason I say know, this I, has a I'm, place is it's like not necessarily like Todd saying of gaming while on the bus, but if I do just pack my controller with me and I'm going and I'm going to be stuck somewhere for a period of time that I can play for an hour and I don't want to pack my console, but I have an internet connection. Or if I'm going up to my bedroom real quick and I want to game a little bit, not on my television, but as I'm getting ready to do something else, or I don't know, silly things like maybe in the tub, I don't know, but just where you're not at your desk at your, you know, couch, maybe it's a beautiful day out. I sit out on my porch and I set up my tablet real quick and bring my controller and I'm just enjoying the sun while gaming. It's just an ability yep. to take what you already own and present it on other devices to do it as well as, and here's a key piece for me with the Microsoft solution, right? Is that it's tying into this other piece of theirs about you buy the title once and you can play it everywhere. And it's going to be entirely important when it comes to the PC experience because the Microsoft store, and this is actually one of my interesting comments. I'm curious anybody's thoughts of whether it actually detracts from a needy a need to buy a Series X is that I can essentially buy the exact same game that I would play on a Series X in most cases and play it on my PC I already have. And if I'm playing for the streaming service or something, I could easily stream that back to my television for those games that I want to couch experience on and such and not have to buy an additional Series X to put there kind of thing. And so... I'm kind of curious where that will go. And as it leads into, and we'll, I'll let you finish your thought, Todd, and we'll talk a little bit more about streaming options, even beyond the consoles that we have. So, Todd. No, I, like I said, I'm, I'm just, I'm just old. And I, it's part of my reality thing that I compartmentalize. So like the phone is a work device. Like I don't even, I don't even play, um, like, I don't even play Candy Crush on my phone Okay. as a rule, right? So the phone is the work device. My PC, my PC is between a work device and a play device. But honestly, if I really want to be, if I really want to be efficient, I only use my PC for very specific work tasks. And then I would use my laptop, my company laptop, to do work stuff, even though the display is is much in is inferior gotcha because i get distracted easily i just do i can see the little theme icon down you know down in my tray going yes you want to play europa just five more turns (laughs) you want to play you want to play isaac or you want to play civ six or whatever um so yeah i just that way so i never looked at the phone as a gaming device Okay. Um, I'm still I'm still bitter over the fact that we didn't get we didn't get the casual CCG variants of Hearthstone because they Blizzard wanted it to be on phones and tablets, and they didn't they didn't. I don't think that they figured out a way to be able to in any sort of way that would work on a phone, but they wanted it on the phone, so all that stuff got scrapped. Um, and yes, I'm bitter. I'm, I'm aware. <laughs> uh, so I just, uh, yeah, I just, I, it, I guess it's the embarrassment of of having an engineering job for so long that I really need mobile gaming. I can buy a mobile gaming, pla- you know, a mobile gaming, a device that's designed for mobile gaming, e.g., yeah. the Switch or the DS or. Okay, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. A dedicated platform. Um, yeah. I, I, well, I think that for me, like, the way I the way I mobile game is I don't use it exclusively. Like, I can't just sit and play a game on my phone. That's boring. But if I sit and play a game on my phone while I'm watching a, a TV show that half catches my interest, I can do both, right? There's a lot of TV shows that I can I enjoy, but I can't give 100% of my attention because I get bored, right? Like, if I'm watching, like... like you know, if I watch like a documentary or something, then yeah, I can give it my whole attention because it, it usually requires some concentration. But if I'm watching some like, I don't know, uh, some some Dragon Ball Z or something, I don't need to give it 100% of my attention because 
there's approximately one thought every 20 seconds, right? Yeah, the rest um, is just, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I often use my, 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 my phone for gaming with, uh, you know, passively. And I think that's fine. Um, but, no, I think, I think the idea of being able to stream anything and pause with, like, a, uh, an external pause mechanism that allows you to pause any game as a state pause rather than a in-game pause is a really powerful thing that you can do in a phone because then you can, you know, regardless of what game it is, you can create it as a mobile game that way. Gotcha. So we talk a little bit how they're going to have these ways of acquiring games, streaming, doing things like that. We did look out a little further because that's another discussion about what you can do to get access to gaming that isn't necessarily buying a console or a PC even in some cases, depending on what your situation is. And I, at Ken's behest, I actually went and played a little bit of Google Stradia their uh, nice. streaming service that they have. Uh, I signed up for, you get a free month of it, basically, if you sign up. And then after that's $10 a month. And it's interesting because there's this concept that with the way internet is progressing in many places, this is not true for everyone, but if you have a decent enough connection that is reliable enough, theoretically, you don't need to buy gaming hardware. You can instead yep. just have the basic impl- inputs. In fact, with Stradia, I think you can actually buy uh, or Stadia or whichever it's called, you can actually buy their yeah, yeah, yeah. controller and just have that yeah. as your input or device that allows it to connect and do things and then play it on any screen that you have access to. Um, in a day where I know for me, I was actually just talking to people the other day about what would it take to build a solid today spec that you don't have to replace next to your gaming PC. And I've always had the metric myself. If you had to buy it from nothing up, you're spending 1200 bucks or so. Um, now At I usually least, say yeah. that if you're building it with a monitor, if you're doing it and say you already have a p- television you're willing to play on, you can do it for about a grand. Um, and that'll get you into a gaming PC that will last a couple of years and play things well. It's not the top because yes, you can spend as much damn money as you want on a gaming PC and it's not the bottom, for which sure. I think arguably is around five to $600 right now. If you're just trying to get into gaming PC at all and that can game, but it's really at the lowest end. So you can get in there. But in lieu of that, if you can pay a company 10 to $15 a month for access to a server that is a gaming PC, where all they're doing is much like your regular entertainment things of Netflix or Amazon Prime video or music or anything like that, where you basically don't have the content in hand, it's just being sent to you. You can basically rent space on a game server that sends you that experience of games to your house, to you. You on demand, and all you need is a control input and a audiovisual dis- device to see it on. And so, so uh, I would love to continue this discussion, but I'm also aware that we have eight minutes to wrap up the entire idea yes. of Stadia, yes. all the games available, and any other similar devices. So, how well, about I suggest that for next week we do that as a minor topic, and we can okay. wrap it up then. Then we can we can pause on this one to talk more in detail about what gaming services can do. But that concept that you could put perhaps not own the console, not pay for the console, not pay for the screen, and get access to a gaming without it? Does that make mm-hmm. sense to you guys as a base concept? Or is that so new or so different? Or are we maybe not even there that it's, it's just even here that you're like, what? To put, uh, I, there, there would, there's a break-even point at paying 10 bucks a month where the 10 bucks a month would out you would outspend the cost of the console and the games, yeah. right? That's just math. Uh, I am also concerned that we are we are running into there. There's one subscription too many. Oh yeah. So I, and I say this entering my tenth year as a cord cutter. Yep, gotcha. Right. So I I said 120 bucks for three decent channels is absurd to <laughs> pay for. So I'm going to I'm going to get rid of all of it and I can using apps on my Xbox Watch Live Sports. Yep. Right? And then yeah and then ESPN figured out that that's what everybody was doing. ESPN being 30% of the cost of your cable bill in America uh then decided that they were going to get that money anyway. And anything that was any good was tucked behind a paywall. 
Yep. Okay. I, I actually lied. I have three things to offer. So if <laughs> I now I have to this now I have to subscribe to Netflix and Viaplay and Amazon Prime and Stadia and the Xbox gaming streaming service and the Sony gaming streaming service. Like between those six things, and oh by the way, HBO Max in, in Norway, right? I've almost gotten to the point of what my cable subscription would have been, which yes. defeats the entire purpose of getting rid of the cable subscription in the first place. Because getting rid of the cable subscription in the first place was to cut all of the chaff and keep the wheat. Yep. Well, okay. To say nothing of the fact that we need to get rid of region, uh, region specific stuff altogether now. Oh yeah, man. That's like if it's all gonna like if it's all gonna be streamed. That abomination that is Norwegian Netflix <laughs> needs to get purged. If uh, I have to, if I have to have all of those sub subscriptions, and I have to have a VPN to make Netflix think that I'm in America, so that I can get American Netflix, like what do we, what are we doing? So one, if we're gonna do all of this streaming stuff, which is fine, whatever, if that's the business model, so be it. Uh, you got to get rid of the region locking stuff. So I agree. As soon as something comes out, if it's an available on a streaming service, it's on. It's available globally, and that stuff never goes away. So if it shows up on Netflix, it's on Netflix, and the the subscription to the Netflix is okay. what pays for the the content that's out there. So I should never, I should never have to remember. It's like, oh, Doctor Who's not on Netflix anymore. It's on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Like, that's just yeah. those things should not happen. And uh, I think we can. Sorry, go on. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was. I would no. I was just going to run my mouth some more. <laughs> so, okay, I, I was going to summarize because we're getting to the end of the show. So I, I thought you were coming to an end point there. But if you want to, if you want to have any finishing remarks before I do summarize, no, no, no. Go ahead. I, no I, it was. It was really just. It was really just me running my mouth. So okay. you're you're okay. Just fine. you're just fine. Okay. Um, so, uh, I think we're in agreement that generally speaking, uh, Xbox and PlayStation choosing which one you prefer is highly dependent on which games you find to be the, the, the exclusives that you're interested in. And you have to already have a kind of interest in getting a console anyway. You have to have already decided, I want a console. Then you can look at the other things to kind of sway you because the specs are so damn similar. You're going to be more interested in backwards compatibility and the exclusives that are there. Um, as for Stadia and other kind of uh, streaming platforms, the Netflix of games, as they love to say, for all, all things that are, are either subscription-based or, or streaming-based or whatever, the Netflix of X, right? Um, I saw one that was trying to say the Netflix of like tobacco and was trying to sell me that on Facebook. And I was like, I don't even smoke, man. What crappy advertising strategy. Um, <laughs> We'll talk more about that next week a little bit um, and as well as our main topic, wherever that may be. Um, but thank you all for tuning in. If you have any uh, thoughts as well, you can send us an email to vtwshowx at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow us on twitter.com forward slash vtwshowx, twitter.com forward slash dead, and twitter.com forward slash drkenreed for the show of Mr. Wayne for myself. Um, you can also check us on reddit.com forward slash r forward slash showx. Please join us for the discussion there. We're trying to like push that as the place where the forums once were. So go in there and have a chat. That's uh, If you don't want to send an email or if you want to have other people involved, not just us, in, in talking to, we can also read stuff from there. And we, we keep an eye on it as well. So go post in there, our subreddit as well. Please feel free. Um, you can also check us out on Show X um, Facebook by typing in Show Space X on Facebook and finding us there. And Wayne, Wayne's messaging me saying, oh, look at Ken wrapping up for the quiz so you can go because so you can run off. You're absolutely correct, sir. We're always, I'm always late and I always get mocked for it. Like, oh, did your show run over again? I'm like, yes, it did. So I'm trying to be on top of it, okay? Um, if you have any if thoughts for any future shows as well, guys, we are very much open to feedback. Um, and obviously, we've, with with Todd being added to the show, we've we've changed up the format. We're changing how we're doing things around here. Any feedback is welcome because uh, you guys have an, a nice outside perspective and you see what we're producing, not just the internals that we see. So do let us know uh, from technical stuff 
uh, down to show format, um, to whatever, right? We, we appreciate any feedback. Send them into our email, vtwshowx at gmail.com as well. Uh, and put the subject as feedback so we know that's what it's about. Don't read it out loud. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you so much for, uh, for, for, for everything, guys. I always like hanging out with you both. And thank you for hosting, Mr. Wayne. It's always very much appreciated. Absolutely. Todd, thank you for being on. Ken, thank you for being on. We'll get out of here so that Ken can go do his thing. Um, yes, we will continue the conversation next week. So please feel free to email us in, especially on anything we might have missed. Uh, that why you think absolutely one console is already winning over another. I know we saw some of those in the chat. So definitely give us that. Yep. A reminder for everybody, this means peace. This means war. <laughs> all right everybody i'll see you guys later and we'll catch you next week thank you and have a good one uh, as i get here to say it bye everybody goodbye see you next zombie <laughs> good night